So first, um, I want to say a few things about material science. Uh, I know most of you are um, probably physics major and uh, and uh, in you know senior undergrad, I, I believe, um, or or uh, junior graduate students. Uh, so for uh, material science, the overarching sort of scheme is how do we understand from processing to structure to properties? I like a chef analogy the best. I, I know because of COVID-19, many people uh, cook more than uh, they would like to, but but I hope you, you enjoy it too. Um, it's better food. Um, so, so basically, you, you take your raw ingredient and you can cook it differently. Even boil egg, there's different ways to do it. Uh, and then you get different textures, uh, different structures of your dish, and it tastes differently. Some of them yummy, some of them crunchy. Um, and, and, and if the, if the meat you cook is uh, not, not the right condition, it could be very tough, right? It's a, un, un, you know, uh, not, not fun to eat it, right? So then you have different properties, right? So material science is all about how we can change uh, the structure through processing but also most important to understand how the structure affect the property. Now, molecular dynamic simulation, on the other hand, will give you all of these information, right? Um, before I go to molecular dynamic simulation, I'll give you a few um, really interesting piece of materials that's quite famous uh, materials. And you can see the kind of the connection back to physics. The first famous material is called the Invar uh, alloy. This particular uh, alloy has a very special property. It has very, very low thermal expansion coefficient, so that uh, it is used a lot in scientific instruments. And uh, it, uh, uh, because of this, uh, 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 this uh, can't pronounce it. Guilami um, won the Nobel Prize in physics in 1920s. And uh, in fact, to understand this very abnormal zero, near zero thermal expansion coefficient. It's very, very complicated. You use, um, you, uh, you have to resort back to uh, magnetism. Second uh, really uh, interesting piece of material is uh, the high TC superconductor. Those are completely unexpected because face it, they are ceramics. They're not even metals, they're not supposed to conducting in the first place, but they have really, really high TC than the previous metals. And, uh, uh, and then, uh, you know, two scientists won the Nobel Prize in 1987. The third piece of material, uh, I, I probably, um, uh, so everybody probably already know, is called graphene. This is uh, the first 2D material. and. Uh, and has been there's tons and tons of papers and research on this really really unique uh, material. Uh, you can make it really really easily through uh, scotch tape, or you can make really really high quality uh, graphene, really really you know large scale perfect through various deposition methods. The person who's uh, uh, start the fire is a uh, game and uh, is student. And uh, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in uh, 2010, also in physics. Now, let me give you a sense of how generally physics plays into the into the field of material science. The 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 a very very good example is that uh, for simple material structure, it is it is uh, you know it is okay. You can you can think right. But in in um, in more more often than not, you you face the structure. It is so complicated, right? It's so complicated. Then you have to uh, you have to imagine it. A good example is dislocation. Right? Uh, dislocation is a defect. It's a line defect out of crystal. And uh, the person who's responsible for to conceive the concept of this location is a Voltra uh, back in 1905. And then three persons, almost simultaneously, R01, Taylor, and uh, Palani, they conceived that, okay, maybe this location 
responsible for metals plasticity. They published three papers in 1934, almost simultaneously. And then for the next 20 years, nobody really sees uh, or have any physical evidence of this location, but people use this location theory all the time until 1956 that um, uh, H.P. Hirsch observed this location for the first time using transmission electron TEM, which is uh, right, right over here. Right. So what is the dislocation? Uh, I hope this is an animation I can show. No, okay, couldn't find it. All right. So basically, so basically, what what here means is that mathematicians, physicists, go ahead of material scientists, and they develop all kinds of beautiful theories, and then it was validated later. This is a great example to show the complexity in physics and the power of physics to be used in material science, right? So now let's um, go back to the um, to, to sort of the reason why we are, we are uh, using modeling here, right? We're talking about molecular dynamic simulation. So, you know, one important tool uh, in uh, modeling. So the, the most uh, telling graph, why we use modeling, uh, especially compu computer modeling, is that for any human capacity, any capacity being, say, the amount of uh, electricity you produce, the amount of cars you produce in a year, so on and so forth, you, you kind of have rapid growth and then you saturate. Another technical innovation and you saturate again. This is conventional technology. And what about computational speed? Really, the, the the beginning of computation, 1950s, maybe 1960s, the computational speed increase nonlinearly or exponentially. Actually, it follows power law. It follows the uh, the famous uh, Moore's law, right? So it does not plateau, right? This is why the computational power gonna be, you know, greater and greater and cheaper and cheaper. That's why we spend our time to learn tools, computational tools. Uh, so here is a uh, graph of all the Apple computers. First Apple probably 1975, 1976, and then all the way down to the top is, uh, I don't know, probably two, three years old already when I make this graph. But you can see the dramatic difference and in terms of computational speed. Everybody holding a, um, you know, even the even the little computers in your microwave is probably way more powerful than the supercomputers in the 19, uh, 1970s, right? So it's unimaginable. Everybody hold the world's most powerful computers 20 years ago. This is unimaginable. Um, so here I, I I sort of give you an example of of uh, how modeling can complement uh the sort of experimental work. So here I show you a uh, very interesting um, sort of in situ uh, study, mechanical test. So that uh, here is a metallic glass uh, nanorod. This is really small. I believe the lens is about a micron or uh, more or less. And then here are consecutive video frames during this experiment. So now you can see that uh, this nano pillar was uh, broken in half. Uh, but there's no frames in between. And what happened in between? This is our question. And uh, hopefully uh, simulations can help us understand what happens at the atomic level. But more importantly, I think modeling, molecular dynamic simulation, for instance, will provide a alternative answer. Say, if I change the loading speed, if I change the temperature, if I change the material, what's going to happen? What factor matters most? Uh, so usually, the, uh, as a modeler, what you do is that uh, your, your, your key, your only objective is to recreate the physical systems in computers, where the atomic level information is ready readily known. You know every atom, the species, position, and as a function of time, right? 
Uh, so basically, first you have to translate the material system into your mathematical form. In this case, I'll show you how do we do in molecular dynamic simulations. And then we identify and understand the physical process through data analysis. And then you, you gain your understanding. Uh, so here is sort of a um, uh, sort of a explain what molecular dynamic simulation is, but also put it in uh, a position relative to uh, other uh, sort of well-known modeling. So let's talk about molecular dynamic simulation first. Um, everybody probably played Angry Bird before, right? So Angry Bird, you have uh, the touch screen and you can shoot, you know, make the slim and, uh, you know, shoot up the, the, the bird and then the bird goes through some kind of parabola um, and then hit, you know, whatever obstacle or the pick, right? So how is the game engine work? The game engine is a molecular dynamics engine, right? So what it does, it only do this kinematic equation. What is the kinematic equation? You, you have the position, velocity, and the force on any object, in this case this little bird, right? And then you can calculate the position, velocity of the next one thirtieth of a second, and you do it again and again. That's it. So the only thing you do is to update the position, velocity, and find out what is force. And you apply the only law here, that is the Newton second law. A is equal to F over M, that's it. So, so molecular dynamic simulation is basically solving large amount of kinematic equation using Newton's second law. That, that there's all there is to it. So this is classical, uh, molecular dynamic simulation. Now, if we go back a step, you have the electronic level calculation density functional theory, for instance, you solve Schrodinger's equation numerically, you, you try out the you know wave functions and so on to try to see whether you, uh, you are self-consistent and so on, right? That would be a level back, more accurate, but slower and uh, you you could you know you are you're you're looking at a smaller system so on and so forth now we we move one step forward we forget about all the discreteness of atoms and you go go to the continuum level right for instance here is a uh, uh, simple flores uh, heat conduction law right you can solve you, you have to give it a grid and then you solve for the heat conduction temperature distribution and so on, same thing for mechanical stress, uh, so on and so forth, right? So these are different levels from electronic level, from atomic level, that is what we're focusing today, to the continuum level modeling, right? So uh, just to iterate uh, what uh, molecular dynamic simulation is, you are given a bunch of atoms and you have to tell what are their interactions? This is called the force field. Uh, on the right hand side, I give you a um, very simple force field. It's called the Linear Jones force field. It is four epsilon. Sigma is give you the length over the distance to the 12th minus sigma to the r to the sixth that provides the attraction. Uh, epsilon provides the uh, bond energy. And this form is basically over here. It, when uh, the atoms are really, really far apart, zero interaction, uh, and then it prefers a specific lens to have the lowest energy, lowest potential energy, and then they repel, right? So this is the simplest, uh, well, not the simplest, but uh, but rather simple pair-wise uh, interaction. It's called linear Jones. So if you give every atom the position and the velocity, and you know their interactions through this basically analytical form, you'll be able to calculate the acceleration, right? So now from that, you can do the integration and uh, you can get the uh, position and velocity of the next time step, right? So you, you know the position of uh, RT, and now you know the position of RT plus delta T. 
delta t is called the time step. And uh, then you will do it again and again, and uh, you will get the true, you will get a trajectory of the whole system. The complexity is, okay, what is the force field you have to the system? And more often than not, you're not just, for, you know, have six atoms, um, you're going to have millions of atoms, and their behavior sometimes is unexpected, right? So that is why we're, um, you know, using MD to see what is the actual evolve, you know, evolution, system evolution, what is the trajectory, and can we get the physical, uh, sort of, and either structural information, dynamic information, out of it. And uh, here you can see that uh, the uh, the person who's uh, 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 responsible for coming up with, with this uh, formula is uh, Leonard Jones. He was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize, I believe, in 19, uh, 1901, something like that, uh, for studies of um, of a liquid um, liquid gas uh, phase coexisting. Uh, also, this delta T, this time step, should be relatively small. Right, because uh, otherwise your integration is not stable. Right, usually a good uh, uh, good estimate is five percent, or if you want to push it, if you're uh, doing low temperature simulation, that will be ten percent of the vibration period. Right, so for a typical condensed matter, you're talking about a vibration period uh, of ten to the fourteenth uh, hertz. So that so so basically a time step will be roughly, say, a femtosecond, right? That, that will give you a sense of what uh, uh, this integration uh, step um, you should use, right? So before we solve the uh, 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 sort of, a, uh, we, we, you know, uh, we, we have to sort of solve a few um, important um, um, uh, kind of puzzles before we actually tackle a real problem. Uh, this is because even we are simulating millions of atoms, the system size is still very, very small. Give you a sense, right? If we are doing, let's say, um, a thousand atoms across, a thousand atoms across, a thousand atoms across, this is, you know, on the order of, say, microns at the most, one micron uh, cube, and it can take, I don't know, a billion atoms. Right, even a billion atom is tiny, a tiny system. So we have to answer the question, how can you simulate bulk behavior? You're gonna represent bulk behavior, but you have such a small system. If you have a, such a small system, then you know, the rest is, you know, a, a lot of your system is, is exposed to surface, right? We know that surface is different than the bulk, right? We have to use, we have to be able to solve this problem. And uh, here is the solution. The solution is called periodic, periodic boundary condition. What does that mean? It imposes a constraint to the system such that, okay, so the although in this case, we have seven atoms in the system, right? Although you have only seven atoms in the system, right? We automatically consider that the system are duplicated in all direction. Very much like every simulation system we are simulating are a unit cell, right? If you're familiar with the crystal concept, so that the top of it is yourself, the bottom of it is yourself, left, right, front, back, okay? So that there's no surface, every atom is in a bulk setting, okay? This is called periodic condition. Now, in the case of 2D, you will have essentially uh, nine uh, simulation box nearby you, including yourself. What about 3D? 3D, you're gonna have 27 nearby box, uh, including yourself, right? So now, uh, we have to think about the real distance between atoms. For instance, right, if you think that Let's say this atom, uh, let me see if I can get the uh, laser pointer, right? So let's say this atom and this atom, right? What is the distance between them? 
the distance between them will not be the distance from here to here because here it has an image right here. So the distance between this atom and this atom is really this atom, and this atom right? So it will be shorter. Right? This atom is exactly the same as this atom. So usually you take the shorter one, right? So the distance between two atoms in the under periodic condition will be different than just the square root of delta x squared plus delta y squared plus delta z squared, okay? So this will have to be implemented in whatever MD code you're using, right? Now, the second question is that how we can speed up the calculation. See, for MD simulation, the most time consuming part is that you're gonna have to calculate the force of each atom. So if you if you think about, let's say, you know, you write out files, right? Input files, output files, you know, you do your uh, integration uh, of the kin kinematic equation. Those are not taking a long time. You know, if you're in a parallel uh, environment, you're, you're passing information back and forth between processors. Those does not take really, really long time. The most time consuming part is calculating the force, right? So then we have to speed up those. So how do we calculate force? To calculate the force, to calculate the force, think about it. If we are talking about, let's say, a simple two-body force field like the linear Jones, right? So the two-body interaction means that, okay, the force acting on me only depends on the your neighbor, right? It does not affected by other atoms. That's why it's called the two-body interaction. So the force between, uh, let's say, you know, if, if Professor Munier is, is nearby, right? So Professor Munier sits next to me, we're pretty close, right? So the force between me and Professor Munier, the force will be exactly a constant, no matter there's a third person nearby, okay? The third person can be between us, but the force between me and Professor Munier will be exactly the same. It will not be affected by a third person or fourth person, right? That's why we call it two-body interaction. So the question of how to calculate the force on any atom will be looping over all the atoms, will be looping over all the atoms. But this is quite time consuming. So what would be a better solution? The better solution will be, okay, I will create a piece of, uh, I will sort of reserve a piece of uh, memory in the, in the computer so that I will put all the neighbors of me, that means the atoms, uh, sort of their labels or index in this array. So then I will just go through that list. That's good enough. I don't need to go to other, uh, I, I don't need to go to the whole system, right? So, but this is uh, sort of, this has a, a pre uh, requirement is that the shape of the potential has to be short ranged. That means atoms far away has no interaction. So I only need to hold my nearby neighbors. I do not need to hold you know, this atom because this is the interaction I know it's gonna be zero, okay? So basically to, to speed up the force calculation, the first trick we use, we call it Verlet neighbor list. A, essentially use memory to gain speed, okay? This is particularly useful in the early days, um, but, uh, you know, later on it is not, uh, um, uh, you know, as effective, right? Because the computer speed is increasing, right? Uh, also, also another trick is that, okay, we, we not only hold the neighbors just um, near nearby us, we actually hold a little bit more, right? When you hold a little bit more, then you don't need to update them that often, right? So there is a trade-off. If I if I draw a larger uh, red circle, I need a longer array, right? So that will eat up my memory. But at the same time, I don't need to update it that often, right? So for instance, usually in the case of a um, uh, simulation of a liquid or, or a gas, you use a much larger red region because the atom is going to come in and out too often, right? So then you want to have this extra 
layer, extra skin layer, you know, rel relatively thick. But in the case of say uh, low temperature solid, you you know you're gonna have a very thin extra skin layer because you don't want to you know eat up the memory, right? Because low temperatures diffusion is uh, is slow, then you know you don't need to update neighbor list uh, that often, right? So this is called skin layer, right? Now let's come to the question of how do we obtain this neighbor list? I want to essentially get okay. Who is my neighbors, right? I want to put them into the into a, a an array of mine. Um, an easy way to do it is I'm going to loop. If I have a hundred atoms here, right? Let's say you know we have uh, 40 also students in this WebEx call, right? Who are my neighbors? I need to go from first person. First person, okay. Go through first person, second person, I will calculate the distance. If they are within a certain distance, I will call it my neighbor. Right? You can go through one all the way to 40, and I will get all my neighbors. And second person goes through one to 40. All the neighbors for second person. All the way down. So you've got a loop 40 times 40. Now, if you're a little smarter, you know, oh, I already looped, you know. Uh, when I when I say loop uh, from uh, you know when I come to say the last person I already know everybody's distance because you know they already calculate the distance between uh, everybody to number forty right so then you probably can save half of the time right fine but the scaling is the same this is called n square scaling that means your if your system blows up ten times your computational operation will be a hundred times more right because you're going to loop you're going to have a double loop right um so what would be a better way because we do know that we want to study large enough system uh to be useful right so the so the solution is called so-called the link cell right so how does it work so here we show you a system fairly big i don't know maybe a 30 also 40 uh atoms already in it the trick, the trick is that we are not going to do a double loop, but rather, first step is that we are going to throw the atoms in the grid. Okay. Now the next step would be okay. If I want to say understand what is uh, okay this atom, right? If I want to know the neighbors of this atom, what should I do? I just figure out which grid this atom is. Okay, this is the grid. Then I'm going to find the neighbor's grid because this is a grid. You already know what are the neighbors of the grid. So it will be boom, 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 boom. There will be nine grid, right? Now I'm going to go into each grid and loop over all the atoms. So now let's say if, uh, uh, you know, let's say this atom will be the neighbors, this atom will be on neighbor. This is probably a too too far away, not in the you know part of the neighbor. But the key is that I do not need to loop over this atom because this atom is not in a grid that is neighbor to this grid. Make sense, right? So many many of the atoms I don't need to loop. This becomes an order n operation with some overhead, of course, so that if your system is ten times larger your computational speed will be just 10 times slower it's not going to be a hundred times slower right so the so the uh, put another way right so this is like let's say what is your uh if you are you know in a big building right in a big building and you're in a particular office you want to see what is my uh neighbors right so you only loop over the office nearby you you don't need to loop over if you're in the third floor you don't need to loop over to the seventh floor right you know so that so that's why you save a lot of time that way right so you basically you course screen your system you find your grid and then from the grid information you know your locality so use the locality information to speed up the neighbor list building from a double loop to a 
linear scaling, right? So it's only an order and calculation. So this particular technique is called link cell. It is used in all MD simulations, right? So you are so so that uh, if our system increases ten times, we only expect the simulation to slow by ten times, right? So now in comparison, uh, for let's say you know DFT calculations, you would dream to have an order n uh, scaling, right? So uh, question number four. Now uh, the we, we talked about the, you know a little bit about uh, Moore's law. The Moore's law at I don't know maybe 10, 15 years back, all you you know we were talking about essentially the um, the single processing, right? Probably 10, 15 years ago. I don't know 15, 20 years ago. The the idea of parallel computing is uh, taking taking more and more uh, prominent position so that even the you know the laptop we're using today have multi cores and they handle um, their their duties you know through parallel computing and uh, also GPU right are the sort of the recent um, uh, sort of focus right so how do we speed up the computational speed uh, using parallel uh, calculation right so the so the key thing is that you want to divide up the job among the different processors. At the same time, you know, if the jobs are divided up across different processors, they need to exchange information because my atom will be your neighbors, right? So this information has to be exchanged. The most um, sort of a common uh, parallel algorithm using MD is called spatial decomposition. There's other ways to do it, you know, less uh, sort of a, uh, you know, involves less programming, but uh, uh, spatial decomposition is the best, um, which has been, you know, implemented in LAMPS and the AMD, you know, the standard uh, molecular dynamics package. So the basic idea is this, you're going to divide the system according to their position, very much like a link cell, right? So you divide them up and each grid Will hold, will be responsible uh, by one processor. Now, now in this way, this processor only need to communicate with the nearby processors, right? It, this this CPU has no uh, sort of a reason to communicate with this processor because it's not nearby, right? So that's the beauty of it. From locality, you reduce the amount of communication in parallel. Computing reduce communication is really really important, right? So how do we how do you do it? You basically exchange your information from the left to right, uh, and then top, uh, bottom, then front back, right? So there is a sequence. Then everybody, you know, is every essentially every time step you have to exchange that information. So your information of my my atom's neighbor is always kept. Um, updated. So this extra layer, we call it ghost atom. Every processor, this processor has no responsibility of updating the ghost atom position using the kinematic equation. The ghost atom's uh, force is not calculated whatsoever. It will only be updated through communication. Okay. So through the idea of ghost atom and uh, spatial decomposition and ghost atom, uh, we can use parallel uh, computing to help speed up molecular dynamics simulations. Now, the idea of this locality is important. Many of the early versions of IBM's um, supercomputers actually physically link the uh, CPUs that way, right? So you can see uh, all, all kinds of early versions of BlueGene. They have a specific topology between the computing nodes, right? So it will be even faster, right? Think about you're matching your simulation with the connectivity of the individual compute node, right? That will be the fastest, right? All right. Okay. So now let's uh, you know go back to uh, uh, physics a little bit. So we 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 so far we consider MD molecular dynamic simulation is basically okay. We know the atom, we know the species, we know their interaction. The force field is, you know, can be written by an analytical form. 
and we can cover the force, the position, velocity, that's it, right? How do we relate to other physics of the system, right? So we can actually link to all the uh, classical uh, physical quantities. Here we show some thermodynamic uh, variables. We can calculate the temperature, basically uh, through equipment uh, partition, uh, we'll be able to calculate the uh, temperature using the average uh, velocity, basically average uh, kinetic energy. And uh, we can also calculate mechanical properties like stress, right? So we can use the Vero calculation to calculate is essentially not only the pressure, uh, as I write it over here, you can calculate the complete stress tensor. Not only can you calculate the stress tensor of a whole system, you can calculate a local stress tensor. So think about, uh, I'm interested in fracture. I'm interested in what is the stress state? What is the, uh, you know, shear stress, normal stress, when a crack opens, what is the criteria? Right? So MD simulation will give me all of that information. Now, uh, from a StatMac point of view, MD simulations can simulate uh, microcanonical ensemble, canonical ensemble, um, MPT, grand canonical ensemble. MD can handle all of them. But what is the ensemble of the original MD simulation? If you do, if you do MD simulation without any modification, sort of the plain vanilla type of MD simulation, what is the ensemble, what is the ensemble that corresponding to? Remember the plain vanilla MD without any modification is a microcanonical ensemble, NVE. Essentially, you are an isolated system, right? Your isolated system, the number of particles stay the same, your volume is the same, and your total energy is the same. What is the total energy? Your kinetic energy and your potential energy. They exchange, but the total energy stays the same. So the NVE simulation, the NVE microcanonical ensemble is the first simulation if you're doing any, you know, a new system, you know, you're implementing a new force field, you're, you're, you're looking at a new molecular system, this NVE simulation is the first simulation you have to do, okay? And especially important is that you want to check your simulation is stable or not, integration-wise, right? So what do you check? You check the total energy. If your system, if your force field calculation, your force field is right, your time step is acceptable, your total energy should stay constant, okay? Your total energy should stay constant, NVE, right? Your total energy should stay constant. If, for instance, your total energy is uh, drifting away, your time step is wrong, or your force field calculation is wrong, right? You probably need to go back and check. Right. Okay. So here, here, um, beyond macro ensemble, I'll give you some uh, examples how we're gonna control the system so that we can study other ensemble. Uh, first, this is uh, how we can control the temperature. So this is a very simple, uh, basically temperature. Uh, so called the velocity rescaling. Basically, okay, my temperature, my target temperature is T target, and my current temperature, which I can calculate from the average uh, kinetic energy, is uh, TT, right? So then I can calculate the kind of a scaling factor between the target and my current temperature, and then simply I can just scale it, scale my. Uh, scale all the velocities. So if my, my temperature is lower, so I will scale all the velocities to match whatever the target temperature is. This is really, really simple, right? However, in this case, you are, uh, you may put the system in a sort of, this perturbation uh, is, um, is uh, could cause a lot of um, sort of a, um, unphysical, uh, behavior of the system, let me say that, right? Because you are changing the velocity quite dramatically, right? If, if you are right now 200K and you're targeting 300K, you are, you know, increasing the velocity of all atoms by a specific factor, right? Square root of, uh, that's a lot, 
right? So the system will not be happy. And, you know, more often than not, you will overshoot, right? And then it will, you know, create a lot of um, uh, oscillations and so on, right? So this is not a very good way to do it. For any uh, research level simulations, we never use velocity rescaling. We have to use some more gracious, um, more physical ways to uh, to control the temperature, right? Again, the plane when they total energy, the total energy is a constant. It does not, the temperature may change, right? Uh, so that if you want to uh, sort of study constant temperature behavior, you have to do this extra manipulation of the system, right? So what is uh, uh, a slightly more advanced method is called the Anderson thermostat. What is the Anderson thermostat? The Anderson thermostat is that, okay, uh, instead of rescaling all the atoms by a, you know, a common factor, I'm just going to exchange, I'm going to just change one atom's velocity at a time, okay? And what is the velocity I'm gonna change to? I'm gonna change to by sampling a Maxwell distribution of the desired temperature, okay? So this is pretty, uh, physical, right? So then, okay, so basically my, my system is 200 Kelvin right now. I want it to be 300 Kelvin. I'm gonna change one atom velocity at a time. I'm gonna sampling around a right distribution out of a 300 Kelvin thermal distribution, velocity distribution, you know, Maxwell distribution. And after I do all the atoms, I'll probably have a distribution similar to the Maxwell distribution at 300K, right? So this is the way more physical um, method, Anderson's thermostat. The idea of that is almost can be understood as follows. So basically you have a bunch of, uh, you have a thermostat nearby with the target temperature and the atoms in that thermostat bumps with the atoms in your system head on so that they exchange velocity. That's why you're taking, you're sampling the 300 Kelvin velocity distribution and you assign it to one atom, right? So essentially the collision exchange, the velocity, and that would be the interaction from your system to a thermostat. This is a coupling from your system to a thermal step to, to essentially achieve a canonical uh, micro ensemble, right? It's a canonical ensemble, right? right? So the similar idea can be also used to control pressure as well. So in this case, the, the, uh, you have to introduce the, uh, a, a fictitious mass to the piston. So the piston will have a kinetic energy and a potential energy, and you have a equations of motion for the piston as well. And at the at the end of the day, you will be able to control both the temperature and the pressure. So you will be able to control N, V, uh, and T. So, uh, sorry, N, T, and P, right? Uh, so in this case, we will, um, uh, so uh, the, uh, so there are other, uh, Method, uh, Nuzi Hover uh, thermostat. So they are built on extended Hamiltonian. They are more physical. They're physical, uh, better thermostat. So that uh, these are the different ways we will be able to control the system under different constraints. Right. Now let's go to the, um, the I would call it heart and soul of. Uh, molecular dynamic simulation. So I, I told you how the, from an algorithm point of view, how it is accomplished to treat this rather small system using pure bonding condition, and uh, how do we get, uh, how do we have a way to calculate the force using neighbor list, and how to update neighbor list using link cell, and how to do parallel. Um, but everything, everything comes down to how good your force field is, okay? So it, so basically how your, uh, how the atoms are interacting with each other. So there are many, many 
different force field, right? So there's uh, pairwise force field, two body interactions, linear rooms, or the simplest might be just a um, a, a hard hard sphere um, wall, right? Um, and then comes to more sophisticated, there you can have a angular bending, you know, angular spring. You can have a torsional term, four body interaction. You can have, um, you know, electronic, uh, electrostatic interaction, uh, and you can have a covalent interaction. So there are so many different um, types of bonding you can write in here as an analytical form to uh, model different materials, right? So a very general way of writing the force field for a um, for a system is uh, as follows. So basically here you have the uh, essentially the potential energy of the whole system. It consists of the self term. This is basically just every atom. If you have any self term there, most of the MD simulation do not have this uh, self term. And this is the pair term. This is basically you are looping over all the pairs of atom, and then you have the three-body interaction triplets. So you're going to loop over all the and the quadruplets. You loop over all the quadruplets. Of course, they have to be nearby, right? For the for the uh, case of uh, torsion. Now I want to say that for uh, triplet and uh, you know essentially three-body terms, fourth-body term. Sometimes you have many-body terms. You're considering some kind of a um, average density in the sense of the DFT, right? You have to have the average electron density locally, then it will affect the interaction uh, of the overall potential energy. Those are quite expensive. Why do I say expensive? Is that it takes a long time to calculate, right? So, so for instance, for, for the pair interaction, you just loop over pairs, right? But the three-body interaction, think about it. It intrinsically, it's a triple loop. Okay, this is a triple loop. Of course, many of the um, triple loop, you, you know, you, you don't have to do the triple loop because you have all the link cells and link neighborless. Nonetheless, the computational speed will be drastically um, uh, slowed down if you have these, um, you know, angular term or torsional term. Okay. So here uh, is a example of a uh, force field. You can see here, this is bound stretching, right? Uh, you can, you know, just by looking at the formula, you kind of know what this term means, right? So here is your length. This is basically loop over all the pairs, right? So LJ is your length of that pair, the bound length of the pair minus LJ zero, that is your um, uh, sort of target or, or a equilibrium bound lens, square that times K over two, that is your elastic energy, it's your spring energy, half uh, K and L squared, right? So a sort of a spring, elastic spring term, right? To stabilize some kind of biomolecules or something like that. And then you have the angular band this is also in a Hooke's uh, form. You have the angle of a triplet and minus the equilibrium or the uh, preferred uh, angle and then square, then times the K over two, right? This is a spring, angular spring. And then you have the torsional term right here. Uh, and then you have the uh, sort of uh, non-bounded vendor-bound interaction. You already see this 12, six term. Now here, this is is looping over all the atoms, regardless, regardless of their, uh, 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 of their, you know, within the molecule or not. But these bound stretching and angular bending, you have to tell the atom if you are bounded with me, right? So it is not bounding over to all atoms, right? So the, so the, what I'm saying in this is, is that this particular form in implies this form is non-reactive. You have to tell, you have to tell the atoms are bounded to another atom. Make sense, right? So this is as uh, is, is opposed to a reactive 
uh, potential, you can have a bound breaking. Look at this. This bound will never break. This bound will never break. Make sense, right? So if if L, you know, you stretch, 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 and the resistance is gonna be higher and higher, you're, you're never gonna break it, right? So this is a classical molecular mechanics, non-reactive forces, okay? And here is the uh, uh, Coulombic interaction. Now, the complexity of Coulombic interaction is that it is long range, it's one over R, right? Not one over R12 or one over R6, so that it dies really, really slowly, so that you cannot use a short range trick uh, to calculate the force. You have to use other tricks. Uh, we don't have time to um, discuss today, but there are uh, ways you can, you can calculate uh, through the reciprocal space that will make it a short range, right? So part of it, you calculate in the real space, part of it, you calculate in the reciprocal space, you'll get it uh, way quicker. Otherwise, you know, the, uh, the calculation is too long because it's long range. Okay. Now here, I will, I'll give you two examples of uh, kind of really common um, potential we used today. One is the EAM potential. This is actually motivated by the density functional theory uh, idea that the, the interaction or the potential energy of an atom depends on how many neighbors surrounding you, uh, particularly by what is the electron density those neighbors give to you, right? So the potential energy is separated in two terms. One is the pair term. This pair term is, uh, you can think of it similar to the one we showed before. This, but this is looping over all the nearby, nearby atoms, right? So this is just a pair term. This term is called the embedded term. The row I here is essentially, I'm going to loop over all my neighbors. Each neighbor will give me electron density. I'm going to sum it up. That will be rho i. Uh, and then f rho i will, you know, this is the embedded uh, function. Uh, so that depends on rho i, I will have a uh, embedding term right here. And this summed up to be the potential energy for all the atoms, right? So essentially, this uh, EM uh, potential is many body. Means that uh, the the uh, the um, so so basically, how many neighbors surrounding me? What is the distance away from me? Matters, right? That is the sum of it contributes to rho i. If this is different, f will be different, right? So basically, this is the idea of embedded uh, atom method. It used primarily in the field of uh, metals and alloy. Many of the uh, mechanical properties uh, for crystalline metals or amorphous metals are used uh, uh, are using EAM potential. Uh, this is particularly useful for alloys because um, you know if you develop one one species, you know one potential for one alloy, another alloy can be directly used because the uh, the, the key term is the electron density. You already know the electron density for each alloy. You just you know add it up. But there's some cross term you have to work out as well. But uh, uh, overall workload is pretty, you know, manageable. All right. So the second uh, force field we call it uh, bound order potential. So bound order potential is uh, is more, you know, if you if you think about the embedded atom potential coming out of BFT, this is sort of physicist's potential. So bound order potential almost like a chemist's potential, right? Because bound order uh, is a is a concept uh, from uh, you know chemists, right? The idea of bound order is that how many bound are you, right? So so basically you're counting bound, you're counting bound. Uh, there are many flavors of bound order. The first one is probably tersif. Uh, earlier there's a ball, and then uh, tersif Brenner. Uh, uh, Don Brenner happens to be my uh, postdoc advisor, um, so. Uh, but I'm actually not using too much of, of, of his uh, potential. Uh, but uh, anyway, so here uh, you can see that the potential energy of the uh, of a bound order potential goes like this. So here is the repulsion.
term and here is a traction term in a kind of a exponential form. Uh, and then you have a bound order term right here. Okay, so the bound order term is counting the bound. So basically, what what does that mean is that okay, if you are if you have a lot of bound, this number is going to go up, right? So think about you have a traction term, and you have a repulsion term, right? If the bound order term changes, right? Essentially, it's a pre-parameter is changing so that if you look at the overall curve not only the overall curves bound length will change but also the bounding energy will change so what happens is that if you have basically the easiest way to think about bound order is just the number of neighbors okay this is the simplest way you can think of so the effect of this is that once you have more neighbors, your bond equilibrium bond length will increase and your bond strength will decrease. If your neighbors are fewer, your bond length will be shorter and your bond strength will be stronger. Okay, so I'll give you an example carbon, you know, carbon material, graphene, um, three bonds, right? SP2 versus diamond. Uh, so that graphene, not only the bound is a little shorter, but also the bond is way stronger than the carbon-carbon bond in diamond. Because in diamond, there are four neighbors. So the bond is a little bit, a little bit longer, but also the bond is, uh, you know, weaker, way weaker. Uh, this is because, car you know, graphene and diamond, they almost have the same, almost the same atomization energy, right? So the, the uh, potential energy, if you put in MD, there's very, very similar, okay? So basically there are different flavors uh, of, uh, of uh, potentials. So basically bound, bound order potential also taking care of local neighbors, right? And you can consider, you can use it to model rather sophisticated uh, uh, systems, uh, primarily for semiconductor. Like, you know uh, these carbon hydrogen hydro uh, carbon systems so uh later on people have been you know looking at the two potentials wait a minute they're actually quite similar because all of them uses this local information the local information of either you know in terms of bond order or the local electron density all depends on how many neighbors around you and what is the distance, right so and actually have a very, very, you know, quite smart paper to link the bond order potential and the EAM. In fact, there's a specific condition that those potential are exactly the same. So later on, people have used EAM potential to study semiconductors as well. Bond order potential has also been used to study metals and so on. For instance, the REACTS FF, there's a lot of metals uh, potential implementations there as well, right? Okay, so now uh, we discuss so many different force fields from simple linear drones, um, you know, even simpler repulsive only hard sphere potentials, and then to the linear, you know, linear spring, angular spring, this bond, you know, molecular mechanics, mechanics model, and then to sophisticated EM potential or um, or uh, uh, bound order potential. So what how do you choose your force field so i'm going to uh invoke um uh have a quote uh judicial minimalism if it is not necessary to decide more to a case then in my view it is necessary not to decide more to a case anybody knows who said this I i'm gonna open up chat uh Oh, there's a there's a question. Okay, Let, let's. Uh, anybody that knows what, who uh, who uh, said this? Hi, I did. <clears throat> so yeah, on the previous slide, what were alpha and beta on the? Sure. Right. So these are parameters controlling the extent of reaction of repulsion and attraction. Basically, in a bound order potential, let me. 
Well, let me uh, hook up my uh, my tablet. Right, so the repulsion is basically something like this, right? Right, this is kind of A, right? If, if we just take this, this will be. So essentially, alpha will control the extent, you know, it is really short or really long. Make sense, right? So here, the, the uh, this will be minus B for this attraction will be like this, right? So the so the so the essentially the sum of them will be basically you know will be something like this. This will be the sum depends on b, right? So now for a uh, so for this will be let's say b is equal to three, and for um, for b equal to four. Let me let me try to see if I can draw it. So the bond will be longer, but it will be more shadow. See? So this will be B equal to four. Okay. I see. Yep. So basically in the in the case you wanna um parameterize this force field, you have to input essentially the equilibrium distance. In the case of B equal to three, B equal to four, basically different polymorphs of either crystals or molecules, and you're gonna try to hit them by tuning alpha, beta, A, B, and and your whatever bound order uh, parameter you are using. Yeah, so yeah. quite a you know tedious work. <laughs> All right. Well, okay, so let's. Uh, so, so, so basically, I, I, anybody knows who I wrote this quote? You can uh, chat back in the in the in the chat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. All right. Okay. So this guy. Anybody knows? He actually went uh, uh, come come to RPI. Uh, it must be four four or five years ago, three, three four years ago. This is uh, Chief Justice uh, John Roberts. Um, so Supreme Court has been uh, in the news uh, recently. So um, so so basically the the, the the key thing I wanna I wanna modify is that what he said is that if it is if it is not necessary to rule more then it is necessary not to rule more right so in the case of a choice of a force field i would say that if it is not necessary to include more terms then it is necessary not to include more terms so this is my modeling minimalism right so that if let's say a, a torsional term is not necessary to include i would not include it i I have to exclude it. Make sense, right? So this is my philosophy. You have to know what is your system. Your system, uh, you have to know the physics of your system, right? And at what level you want to have the modeling up, right? So if you are, you know, uh, uh, studying, you know, electron transport, forget about MD, right? Period, right? So MD is not not capable of doing that. So that if you feel you, so you have to think what is your your physics you want to target, then you try to figure out what is the proper force field, not anything more complicated, right? So this is my philosophy of uh, model modeling minimalism, right? All right. Um, okay. So now I'm gonna give you some kind of more of a show and tell uh, without going much of a detail, right? Uh, so I will just show you some my my recent work. This work was uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor Jian Shai in my department, and uh, so works on perovskite uh, structure on uh, solar cell. So my my job is just uh, to 
uh, set up this deposition simulation, especially how the dislocation is affected by the way of deposition. Uh, so the uh, so the experimental side is that they they tried different uh, mode of epitaxy. One of them is called a remote epitaxy, Van der Waals epitaxy, or the normal epitaxy. For normal epitaxy, there is a huge mismatch between the lattice constant, the perovskite, and the the uh, substrate. Then there are a lot of defects, dislocations, and so on. Well, if you put a uh, graphene layer in between to create the so-called uh, Van der Waals epitaxy, the um, the uh, dislocations disappear because of the easy sliding and realignment of the film, right? So here I'll just show you a deposition. So what you see here is that a uh, uh, little bit purple uh, atoms. They, I believe, uh, uh, they are graphenes, and the uh, and uh, the three component of the perovskite are going to come down, and they're going to form the perovskite uh, crystal, right? So because there are three components for the perovskite, you can see that they are coming down. Now you can see this homogeneous nucleation. The little crystals are uh, um, forming everywhere. And now they are going to, because that the because of the graphene layer in between, so that the crystals can rotate, they can realign themselves when they touch each other to eliminate the dislocations. This is very, very, very important. You can see the really, you know, beautiful crystal structure right here. So I'm not sure if the animation um, shows up uh, reasonably well in the in the chat. I mean, um, through WebEx, if someone can. Um, Send me a chat. Is it? Can you see that animation? It, it's a it's low frame rate, but we can see the animation. Okay, you you can right? Yeah, it's just it's just like a little a, little candy. Got you. Yeah. Got you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now you can see that uh, I basically uh, build the bond uh, between the vertices of the cube, and you can see the the uh, essentially the uh, uh, the perovskite structure. So now we can go ahead and do analysis uh, of this really complicated structure of the of the perovskite uh, thin film. And what you can see is that we can identify all the dislocation lines. The misfit dislocation lines around here. So you can see here the dislocation line. Here is another dislocation line, and uh, very importantly, we can identify the mis not only the misfit dislocation but also the threading dislocation. Those dislocations are perpendicular to the substrate. You can see here. So if you grow, uh, you, know, you keep growing, the threading dislocation is coming out of the film, right? So it's uh, it's not going away. This is very detrimental to the thin film quality. Uh, here is a threading dislocation. I believe here is another one, right here. So you can see the little um, uh, black arrow. Those are the dislocations, Burgers factor. So uh, we can all identify those as well. Um, okay. So the uh, second example I'm going to show you is the uh, a simulation of a particular phenomena called uh, stress corrosion cracking. Anybody knows what does that mean? Stress corrosion cracking. Anybody heard anything related to that or kind of a historical um, thing? You know, can type type in the in the chat or just speak up. Doesn't matter. All right. Is there everybody? Andrew. <laughs> okay. Right. Stress corrosion cracking was first um, colonized when uh, the British uh, army, uh, when, when they colonized uh, India in the in the wet and uh, warm weather. Um, so many of the shells uh, will crack up, right? So this is because the really, really high amount of uh, manure um, uh, methane, basically, uh, they they work together with the stress um, when 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 they manufacture the shell. You have this residual stress from the thermal processing. So the chemical 
and the stress work together, they extend the crack so that the metals basically break apart. Uh, so this is called uh, stress corrosion cracking. So you have to have chemicals, you have to have stress, and the crack will um, will will grow. Um, so the uh, way to mitigate that is that uh, you can either anneal the shell, so you remove the stress, or you of course you know you 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 you, you know store it without any chemical environment. Um, so this is a quite complicated uh, um, sort of uh, phenomena, right? Uh, but very, very important, right? So you can see a, a lot of uh, failures around the world have a chemical component, uh, not only have a stress component to it, right? So this is a really, really fundamental uh, a question, how the chemical, uh, you know, essentially here in terms of, uh, you know, um, chemical concentrations and uh, how that affects the overall crack growth rate at a given mechanical agitation, right? So the mechanical agitation really uh, use stress intensity factor to, to characterize it. So, okay, so here I will show you this animation. The blue, so you can see here, this is a glass sample. This is basically a blue atom and a red atom. Uh, I have to use a binary system to make a glass. So why I make a glass? Why I study crystal? It's because if I study crystal, I have to go through the different orientations of crystal, which is complicated. Uh, you know, it's you have to, I don't know, do a few of them, and nobody knows if I change another crystalline orientation what the result's going to be. So I'm going to uh, study uh, glass. It will be isotropic. Your uh, conclusion will be more general, right? So why I use binary systems? Because if I use a single component, it is very easily crystallized. Okay, actually, you can see that from uh, you know today's uh, example later. So, single component is very easy to crystallize. So I have to use binary system to frustrate the crystallization. So, so I will stabilize this glass. Right. So I use this glass as a as a uh, kind of a load bearing material, and I create a crack over here. And then these yellow atoms, those are corrosives. Um, again, I use this modeling minimalism, right? So I do not want to say uh, put in HCl, right? Or uh, my thing here, right? That would be, that would be you know, uh, crazy, right? So, so what, what I will do is I will uh, basically, this is the simplest possible corrosive. What the corrosive do is that uh, the yellow atom preferentially bind to the red atom. So you can think of this as a selective leaching. So there is interaction from the yellow atom to the red atom. It will unplug the red atom out of the glass, right? Selective leaching. So then the chemical effect will couple with the stress and propagate the crack. Okay, so now you can see this is the animation. I'm going to put the mouse at the beginning of the crack, head of the crack. You can see the corrosion is happening, and uh, the crack is uh, growing from a dual um, uh, sort of chemical effect and a mechanical effect over here. So we have, uh, so from here we can actually calculate what is the crack growth rate as a function of mechanical agitation to compare to classical. Uh, theory. All right. Uh, here is another uh, example. This is a quite early work uh, to study the uh, nanoporous carbon. So here we basically throw a bunch of carbons in the system and let it find its best uh, position when we cool them down. So a very sophisticated um, carbon network will be uh, will be obtained. See here. So you can see this is looping back, but basically you can see the um, uh, really distorted and defective graphene sheets are linked up together through the 
uh, through the uh, you know simulated paralysis process. So I want to show you that. Uh, let's see. You know, let's stop at the last point, right? So how do we know we have a good uh, structure? We can actually compare to experimental structural char characteristics like X-ray diffraction and the small angle X-ray diffraction. So the structure is the best. Um, the in uh, so it's the most accurate, structurally accurate uh, nanoparous carbon out there with the uh, experimental uh, structure uh, characteristics really, really well. Over here, right? Um, okay, so that is um, the uh, sort of the end of this uh, presentation. So I hope I give you a flavor of MD simulation is kind of the relative um, relative to other techniques. Uh, uh, I you know I know you guys have been exposed to DFT already. Um, not sure about the continuum part, but basically MD is in between. And uh, we discussed a bunch of useful algorithm typically used in MD simulations. Uh, you know some of them are quite smart, right? So you know in, in case you are developing anything, you know. Algorithm-wise, you might want to borrow, especially the idea of locality, right? It used in link cell, it used in parallel spatial decomposition. Um, and there are various ensembles used in uh, MD simulations, depends on the constraint. We can achieve all kinds of um, different ensembles. We can do free energy calculation as well. Uh, we discuss different flavors of force fields from the simple ones to complicated. and um, and the modeling minimalism. Um, and then I give you uh, uh, some ideas of what uh, uh, sort of real MD simulation looks like, mostly in animations. So, um, so any questions before we move on to the tutorial on the some, some kind of hands-on uh, activity? Uh, I have a kind of quick one. Yep, um, so when you talked about the canonical ensemble, where you had the um, the quick velocity adjustment yep. to fix the temperature, um, how do you add in the grand canonical where you have like the particle bath for those? Right, we we can definitely. So this grand canonical usually we couple with a Monte Carlo step. Right. So essentially, we're gonna we're gonna have a, a judicial judgment, right? You know, um, basically a grand canonical Monte Carlo uh, uh, if, right? Uh, given the you know uh, the input chemical potential and once you insert it, what is the chemical potential? And then we we are you know, going to throw the dice and accept it or not, right? So MD simulation in the case of grand canonical ensemble we have to couple a mc step to it so it is possible okay i see yep other questions okay so adam asked a question are the force field very transferable Excellent question. This is one of the, um, I don't know how to say, um, most desirable <laughs> properties. Uh, so, so if you if you want to see all the proposals on uh, force field development, it's all claiming transferable, um, and uh, I've never seen a truly transferable force field. To be honest with you, uh, the maybe the most widely known uh, force field, uh, widely used, especially by chemists, is the Reax. So Reax supposed to be really, really transferable, but every you know every other system they use a different file. So essentially, it's um, you have to retrain everything. Depends on the on the Right, so it's a. So right now, I would say 
very little, uh, few, very few force field can be considered truly um, transferable. Now, having said that, there are certain simple force field is quite transferable. I think the simpler the force field, the easier it is to transfer, right? Let's say hard sphere, right? It's, it's the easiest, right? <laughs> you have to be transferable, right? Because, you know, basically the size of the atom, right? I can, you know, I develop an argon, you know, you develop a neon, of course, they're going to mix and we can use a simple mixing rule of the argon neon, uh, uh, you know, uh, mixed term, you know, it's going to work, of course. But, uh, you know, Leonard Jones, now there's choice to make. What do you do with the energy, right? You use square roots, geometrical uh, mixing. Uh, and for the linear term, you use, uh, you know, um, arithmetic mixing, you know. Of course, people use that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a, it's more of a convenience than rigorous uh, derivations. And then you come to, say, bond order, many body terms. It's... Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hard. <laughs> yeah, great, great question. Yeah, sure. Other questions? Can I ask a question? But, yeah, go ahead. I mean, that, what you just said relates to my research, so I would have more involved questions and system specific. So I'm asking, would you have time for additional meeting about that? Because sure, usually the techniques that are, that are like directly applicable, but I would have like very specific questions. So would you be fine with a WebEx meeting? Should I email you? Yes. Do you, do you know my uh, email address? Uh, I can look at it, RPI yeah. website. Please. So yeah. I'll be emailing you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Sure thing. Sure thing. Alrighty then. Well, uh, see if there are no other uh, questions, then I guess I'll go ahead and uh, stop the recording, and then we can pick back up at uh, three fifteen. Sounds great. Yes. So yes. So I put the uh, a, a folder called molecular dynamics uh, in the Dropbox that um, uh, uh, can and that probably two hundred megabytes each. So it is in the cyber training RPI shared uh, resources 2020 folder. Yep. And it is called uh, molecular dynamics. And uh, inside there is a Word doc called MD Lab Summer School and a folder called MD Lab. You just need that. It's about 143 megabytes. Okay, very good. Um, so here is what we're going to do. So they are about a one, two, uh, three, four, um, um, sort of uh, MD drops, and uh, each of, each one of them could take a bit, right? So what I want to do is I will show you the basic workflow, and then we will divide up into different rooms. And uh, then we are going to um, uh, sort of, you know, a group of you will, will work on it. You can, you know, solve problems among yourselves. And I, uh, uh, Paul and I will loop over in the room and uh, to, you know, if you have a question, you can do a flag and we'll, you know, come, come there. Um, so that would be the kind of the uh our plan okay so first of all i'm gonna sort of talk you through this um process right so oh all right so here you can see the um the the dropbox folder so i'm not gonna work on uh, on the dropbox so here is my local copy right so um this md lab 
folder has uh, essentially two important, well, actually three, three important um, programs in here. One is the LAMPS. The other is called OVITO. LAMPS is the engine of a uh, of MD engine. So LAMPS runs MD simulations, right? So it will take an input and spell out output. And what is OVITO? OVITO is a visualizer. It visualizes the MD simulation because you know, we, we played the Angry Bird, you know, that we love animation, right? So we need to see how the atoms evolve. Not only that, Ovito can do a lot of extra analysis as well, right? So analysis way is really, really important. I told all my uh, students that uh, we, the, the, the type of analysis you do and the insights you get out of the analysis set you apart from other modelers, not how many cores you have in your group, right? So essentially, the, the analysis really set modelers apart, okay, period, right? Okay, so here I'm going to show you the, how we're going to do a simple uh, flow, right? So let me pull up the uh, Word doc. Uh, well, Word doc, it uh, shows you the kind of the basic information and a, a kind of a basic uh, uh, how to use uh, Ovito as well. I, I'm going to show all of them uh, for you. And uh, so now, first, we're going to run this melt.in first. How do we do that? Right. So first, find this we.exe. This is a search software. I I, uh, I, I, I mentioned in this uh, MD lab. This is a per executable written in per by uh, uh, Professor um, Shankar uh, 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 Raraman. So, so he helped me to, to essentially have a GUI, gra graphical user interface, together in the Windows because the you know, kids today don't like to use uh, command line uh, in uh, Linux. So then uh, I feel like this is way easier. Otherwise, I am constantly, you know, wasting my time, you know, tell you guys how to find a folder and, and all that, right? Exactly where you download it uh, in the, in you know, in, in a command line prompt. Uh, so we ended up using, uh, writing a GUI uh, for it. So first step, double click GUI. We.exe. All right. Now you can see these are the available exercises. You can actually run all of them, right? Uh, but first, we're going to run this in.melt, melt.in, right? So melt.in is you start with the FCC crystal and uh, you're going to just, um, uh, you know, give it a velocity, let it run. In this case, it's pretty, pretty short. It may not uh, melt. So um, then you click launch. Now you see that you can run the simulation or run Ovito, which is a visualizer. So you're going to run the simulation first, then you run Ovito. Okay, so you run simulation. It's very quick. Now, after it goes back from gray, you can run Ovito. Okay, so this is your Ovito interface. Where already run. Uh, the MD simulation. I'm going to go back to the uh, uh, code very quick, but uh, you know I want you to have a uh, sense of what the simulation is all about first, right? So here we load file. Now you can see the the way I always do is I will just click date modified. So this is the newest file. So I will know this is newest file called dump dot melt. So I click it and I open it see here, this is four different views. I like the view of perspective, so I click it. I can click this one too, but I click this one, and then I'm going to uh, maximize the active view port. So then I uh, can see uh, more clearly, right? So again, you go back to the uh, quad view, right? So you click it, and now you can rotate it. You can zoom. Click here. You can in and out, it's convenient. Or you can shift it. 
I can I can shift the box too. I can change, say, if I click particle type, uh, I can change from blue to uh, red to blue, you know, I can change the size, doesn't matter, right? Oh, very importantly, here's a uh, key point. Click the dump dot melt, and here is a file contains time series. You do that, you will see animation. If you don't do that, here you have no animation. I right? click here. Now you can see here this animation. You can drag it. <coughs> you can see in this case the atoms are moving a little bit, thermally relaxing, and uh, so this is your MD simulation. Right. So I'm going to close this, and uh, I'm going to go back now. I want to. I want to sort of spend a little time in uh, in uh, looking at the script, right? So the script is quite short, right? So basically, it uh, you know I, I don't want to go line by line, but it will give you some, some sort of a sense of what does that mean, right? So first, it tells you the unit atom type. In this case, it's atomic. Then it defines the lattice, the crystal of your starting um, uh, system. The system is HCC, it's face centered cubic. Here is the number density, 0.8442. This is not the lattice constant, this is the number density. And it defines a region, rectangular region, 0 to 10, 0 to 10, 0 to 10. That is in lattice, so I have a thousand unicell altogether. FCC has four atoms per unicell, so I got 4,000 atom system, right? And then you create um, box, you have one species in the box, and uh, then you create atoms according to this crystal, the same dimension. And uh, I got a group of uh, all the atoms into the crystal, doesn't really matter. But this is how you define regions and how you do groups. Now, if you want to do the extra task of creating a ball and let it hit another you know slab you have to use this command so here is the command example you can use later okay here's the mass of the atoms velocity and uh, this is velocity all create that means you are uh, creating velocity which is 0.3 uh, reduced unit which is relatively low temperature and then here is the force field it tells you this is the linear Jones this is a shifted linear Jones with a cutoff of 2.5. Outside 2.5, no interaction whatsoever. And the pair coefficient, epsilon is one, sigma, oh, sorry, this is a type one, type one, epsilon is one, sigma is one, 2.5 is the cutoff. And uh, here we use shift, so shift yes, so it is, uh, you don't have an energy um, jump. And uh, then, here is your neighbor. This is the neighbor list we're talking about. The the Verlit uh, neighbor list. Point three is the skin layer. Remember, if you are in a liquid state, you know you put a larger skin layer. If you're in a uh, solid state, you can you can use a smaller skin layer. And uh, this is how you update the neighbor list. And then we use fix one or NVE. NVE. Look at this. Now everything clicks back. We discuss the micro canonical ensemble, NVE. That is the plain vanilla uh, MD simulation, right? The total energy should be fixed, okay? Then time step. This is your delta T. Delta T has to be really small. Usually we use 0 0.005, okay? This is also in reduced unit. And then you dump the, this is basically output all the atom positions using the atom format into dump.melt and every 20 time step. So every 20 time step, you get an output. Every 20 time step, you got an output. And uh, then you got to run for 250 time steps. So this is really, really short. 4,000 uh, atoms and uh, 250 run my, on my, uh, you know, this is a six years old the laptop. It's, you know, takes no time, right? Now, I do want Isaac, we should go back to check whether the total energy is conserved. 
maybe something is wrong with this lamp's code. You know, I have to check. This is my um, sort of habit. Whenever I, I I download a newer version of lamps, whenever I run a new set of uh, uh, parameters or a new mo mo uh, molecular system, I always run NVE first to check the total energy. This is the first thing, sanity check, okay? So where is the total energy? The total energy goes into the file called log.lamps. You can change the file name in the script, but the default one is log.lamps. You can double click. Now you can see it, oops. It tells you the um, all the sort of information. Okay, so here the lattice spacing is given, right? You convert it from the lattice uh, of the uh, number density, and you can see the uh, the system size zero to sixteen point seven nine six. This is your system size, and you know that the system outside will be basically another of its image, right? Remember periodic boundary condition, right? So here, although Although I'm not using parallel simulations, the lamps by itself uses parallel algorithm. Even you are running single processor, okay? So that's why it tells you one by one by one MPI processor. So it uses the same uh, subroutine of exchange information even on its own single CPU, okay? So this is so that you can write one code, it works for all, okay? And uh, so here is 4,000 atoms, all these informations. So this log file is very, very important, right? Never, ever delete it, okay? All right, now here is the information. This essentially is the step, time step, temperature, pair interaction, uh, uh, sort of a, a total energy and pressure, so on and so forth. So now you can see that the total energy, where's the total energy? Right here, I see. The total energy is minus 5.8829 all the way to five minus 5.8828. So down to the fourth digit, it's really, really stable. Okay. So basically we, we know that in this, in this simulation, you can see that the temperature changed quite a lot. It's from 0.3 to uh, only half of it, but the total energy stays exactly the same, right? So this is a sanity check, it passed. Okay, so now you can see other inf important information. You can see the pair time. This is a force field. I told you the force calculation is always the the uh, the 800 pound uh, gorilla in the room. It takes all the time, right? However, if you see that if you run the simulation that your pair time does not take the bulk of it, there's something wrong with your simulation. Either you did not set up the the parallel environment correctly, or your neighbor you know, update something, you know, is, is problematic. Uh, you should aim to have a pair time to be the, you know, at least 50%, 60%. If your communication time is 50%, something is wrong, okay? So you, you shouldn't use that many parallel, you know, nodes, right, in that case, right? So now we uh, examined the micro canonical ensemble, it works and we can see all these information. Remember, if you copy this region up, let's say plot it in say Excel, you'll be able to see how your temperature change as a function of time, pressure change as a function of time, all of these plots. I'm not a big fan of Excel. Uh, uh, I in, on, on Linux or Sigwin, I use XM Grace, way better uh, plotting uh, software. You know, I'm sure you have your own um, favorite uh, plotting software, you know, but basically with this ASCII format of data, you can visualize it. You can visualize it. Okay. Now let's uh, go back. So this is first. Let me let me um, go to the uh, word box. Right. So this is the first melt dot in. We can melt it. How do we melt it? How do we melt it? We can go back to the in the mount and uh, look at this so here here you can see that uh where is the where is the velocity okay see here velocity now it is 0 0.3 right this is a pretty you know not very low uh temperature but not that high if we can change it to three you know it, it might melt, right? You, you, you go ahead and check, right? Change that, 
save it, run it again. Okay? You might also want to run it a little longer. 250 is quite short. Okay? So that is in the amount. Uh, now let's go to this task. I do want to, you know, uh, mention a little bit. Now, I want you to copy to another file. I generally do not want to modify the original file. I want to keep the original file so I can always go back to. Okay. For I think for a modeler, it's a good habit no matter what kind of modeling you do. Right. So modify copy a new file and then you can you know work on it, do whatever modification, you know, your playground. And all you, know, you can always go back if you mess up. Okay. Here, uh, what this extra task is that you create a ball and then create a plate. What is a plate? I already, you know, in the code is already have a region, right? You have a region that is a block. This is how you define it. You can define a plate, right? Say 0, 2, 0, 10, 0, 10 will be a plate. Make sense, right? So you create a ball and a plate. How do I create a ball? So here is a region that is of block. Now you should create a region that is a sphere. How do you know? The, the, the syntax and so on. So go to uh, uh, lamps region. Search the menu of lamps is your best friend, right? So click region. You will see how do we define a sphere. See, this is how you define a sphere, right here. Side in or out. That's your choice. Okay. okay. Where the center is. Uh, what is the radius? Okay. And uh, now, what you need to do is to let the ball strike a frozen plate. So you can, the plate doesn't have to be uh, frozen, but basically, what you can do is that you give the ball a velocity. How do I give the ball a velocity? Look at this velocity, you can give some group of uh, atoms. A particular velocity and you let it strike okay let's see if anybody can um, play with it you know let me know if you have any questions so this will be the extra task you your your uh, uh, sort of a uh, um, task would be just run it you can change the temperature to let it melt you know run it longer use Oveto okay so um, Okay, so let me let me uh, move on. So now I'm gonna run the second um, second uh, code, which is melt dot in a uh, cool dot uh, in. So this will be a uh, you're a heating up, and then cool down. So now we'll see how uh, solidification occurs. Right. So let me. Uh, Let's see what whether I can melt. Oh, here, right here. Melt cool, right? So now you can see this is the same code, almost the same code, except that um, see it is a high temperature and then cool down to really low temperature, 0 0.01. This is really, really low. And I'm gonna not use fixed MVE that was a microcanonical ensemble. This is just MVG. I'm controlling the temperature, not conserving the total energy. So this is a canonical ensemble, right? And we run it quite longer. Okay. All right, we just finished. Then we run Oveto. And again, I'm gonna load file. And uh, here is the first file because this is sorted. And I'm gonna click here. And I'm gonna make sure this contains uh, time series. I click here and uh, uh, make it a little larger, and now I can uh, drag the see uh, because the temperature is pretty high, so that it you know this is a liquid now. Can you see this is a pretty much a liquid, and then it will cool down. So I'm gonna go to the last frame. Can you see? So now we come back. To mostly um, closed packed uh, sort of a crystal, right? It's probably highly defective because the cooling rate is really, really high. Uh, but you can see it, it, it prefers a closed pack 
uh, geometry as we expected, right? Single crystal is really, really, I mean, single component is really easy to crystallize, right? So now you can uh, think about when the, you know, what is the solidification temperatures and so on and so forth, uh, and what kind of defects uh, in, you know, inside the structure, right? So this is another uh, simulation. And I'm gonna close it. Oh, actually here, uh, I do wanna show you here. Uh, there is a, a common neighbor analysis. If you click here, look at this. Now it tells you the structure, the local structure. Here it tells you the color coding. The uh, green atom will be FCC. That will be the ABC, ABC stacking. Look at this. Mostly is actually uh, the red. The, the HCP is a little bit more. Look at this. HCP is AB, AB stacking, right? And then you have a little bit of a BCC too. There's a little bit of a BCC and some icosahedral. Oh, there's zero count. Okay, so there's no icosahedral, but you have even 14 BCC here. That's interesting. Rate is really, really low. I mean, really, really high, right? So you can see the the uh, uh, the defects, the stacking fault. See, this is A B C A B C, and over here you can clearly see this is, you know, see this is A B A B, right? So this is the same as this. This is the same as this. Okay. All right. Any any questions? Any questions? You can you know speak up or uh, use chat. Let me put in chat. So is this is a, a good pace? Should I slow down or you know give me some feedback in chat? Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you for uh, responding. Very good. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the next one. And uh, so I'm gonna close this. The next one, let's see. The next one, so you can actually plot PE versus T, right? So here, uh, this is the log, right? So you can see here, you can plot uh, financial energy as a function of temperature, it's all here. So here it's a two step. The first 500 time step is for you know, achieving, a, 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 you know, heating it up, right? So now you can copy this file over and uh, in Excel, you know, plot it out, right? Plot temperature versus potential energy. And uh, all right, now let's move to the next one. So this one is actually pretty fun. Binary, but in, so it will be this one. So now let's run the simulation. So far, we only use a, use a single component. Once you come to binary, you can actually have a lot of complicated structure. I mean, even single component, the, the, uh, the system is quite complicated. Look at all the BCC stacking fault, you know, HTP and FCC local structure, right? Uh, so, okay, so this is, let's, let's click run OV. And uh, we're gonna, this is really, really fast. I really like the fast simulation so you can um, play it, you know, almost instantaneously, right? So now you can click again, file contains uh, time series. Now this is actually binary, but for some reason, my Ovito always remembers the same color. So I'm gonna change it to um, green. Okay, so this is a starting point, right? I have two types of um, atoms and I actually set uh, they are uh, attractions between the similar, between the dissimilar atoms and their repulsion between similar atoms. So essentially, the red and green, they like to bind with each other. They don't like each other. Red do not like red. Green do not like green, but they like to bind each other. Okay. So now let's see what's going to happen. So high temperature, and then I'm going to cool it down. All right, look at this, look at this. It becomes a quite a beautiful crystal, right? So let me show you another, um, 
uh, function here, create bound. I can basically create a bound. Let me uh, make the bound a little smaller. You see here? Oh, okay. Yeah, this is pretty fun, right? Look at this. Anybody knows what the structure, you know, mostly similar to what? Look at the connectivity, right? This atom is connected, the green is connected to the three red, and red is connected to three green, right? This is almost like a boron nitride, but corrugated. It's a little, you know, it's not planar, right? Uh, now, this is completely pair potential. Right, but it can have this very, very covalent like structure coming out. Okay, all right, all right. So, yes, so basically, controlling the force field, controlling the interaction between red, red, green, green, and red, green, you can achieve a huge amount of complex structures. You can get a linear. Linear polymer, right? Or a, a, a small molecule, all the way to sodium chloride, you know, uh, 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 cesium chloride. You know, you can all look at everything by playing the force field. Okay, so the playing the force field. That's why I always say force field is the heart and soul of MD simulation. Okay, all right. Uh, so let me just open up real quick. To direct you, where, you know what what I'm doing here. Okay, the only important thing is here. Look at this. <coughs> I put a repulsion between one and one, two and two, and I put and I put a attraction between one and two. This is basically just a linear Jones, and the cutoff of one point three. That means it is really short range attraction, uh, but uh, the repulsion between one and one. Two and two are quite large, right? You can see here the C. That means basically one and one. They don't want to be closer than one point nine. Okay, so that think about if I change it to one to two. So so now the one point nine allows it to be a neighbor, right? Think about the hexagonal, right? So the green atom has three reds surrounding it. The one point nine allows that the two red to be in the same neighbor shell of the green. If I increase 1.9, I will become a linear polymer, okay? If I reduce 1.9, I could become a, you know, diamond cubic-like uh, structure, right? So it's, uh, it's all, it's all depends on this parameter, okay? So you can, you know, I welcome you to play with it too, okay? Uh, all right, so this is the, uh, this is the, so this is the extra um, task would be modify the force field, you know, just play it, right? And, and see whether when it plays out, you know, whether the, what you see is what you want, right? And why you didn't see what you want, then you modify it, right? You know, a feedback loop. All right, last one is called 3D.fcc.nanowire.in. This is a, uh, the most heavy simulation. This is more, uh, more of a, how to say, a, um, a almost a full-fledged um, kind of um, virtual in silico mechanical test, right? You know, you can, maybe someone is more uh, uh, sort of, a, you know, want to spend time in, you can actually get some research level results out of it. Okay, so I'm gonna um, show you that. Uh, I have to close this down and uh, I'm close this. All right, so 3D. So all the other works too if you want to play with it, right? Um, okay, so here I'm gonna show you real quick what what does that mean. So here we're gonna create a three dimensional FCC nanowire. And you are going to apply a uniaxial tension test on it. Okay. 
Now here is show you what is the system size. 40 is, is uh, you know, sizable and, you know, it's not that long. Uh, if you really want to have a high quality simulation, you can, you can increase the size or you can want to, you know, study the size effect, right? You can drag it to, to larger uh, systems. Now the rotation angle, the rotation uh, angle basically is that I have this FCC crystal, okay? I'm going to select a vector as my rotation vector, and I'm going to rotate 15 degrees. What is my rotation vector? It will be minus five, 10, and zero, okay? So I'm gonna rotate my crystal so that I'm going to select a nanowire not along the zero, zero, 001 uh, cubic direction. I can actually have an arbitrary, you can calculate uh, you know, I can I can calculate specific, uh, you know, one one zero direction to pull or one 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 direction to pull because the crystal it's anisotropic. You have to study other directions. Make sense, right? So this allows you to rotate to arbitrary crystallographic direction to apply the tension. Okay, this gives you the world's freedom. Okay, so you. You know, if you want, you can select different uh, axes, apply different rotation angles, positive or negative, it's up to you, right? And then there are uh, two more constraints to it. If constrained laterally, what does that mean? So you can have the tension to be applied like this so that you don't have lateral movement, or you can allow the tension and you allow lateral movement, right? Uh, so this is uh, to mimic the experimental tensile test machine. Sometimes the the uh, you only control the displacement in the uh, in the tension direction, and you freeze them. You don't allow it to do lateral shift. Sometimes you allow it to do lateral shift. If you allow it to do lateral shift, this is extra. This is extra freedom so that your slips, your plastic deformation will be different. Depends on the constraint. Most uh, obvious effect is that if you don't allow, if you don't allow the constraint, the, uh, the, the, the sample will rotate automatically because of the slip. If you allow it to shift, you don't have to rotate. Okay, so it, it matters the way you will conduct mechanical test matters. So we have that uh, here as well. Now, IV, this is the pooling speed. You can convert it to a strain rate. Strain rate is very important. How fast you conduct the mechanical test matters, okay? Because why time matters is because the most of the mechanical behaviors are thermally activated, right? So time matters, just like temperature matters, right? Uh, so here is the total time step. This is a uh, 10,000 time step. You can run. So basically the speed and the time together gives you the overall a um, you know, maximum strength, right, uh, of the system. Okay, so let's run the simulation. It will be, uh, uh, take a little bit of time. So now I'm going to um, share this document to you and can do the kind of the next step of uh, group alignment. So I'm going to share this to you. So I'm going to, um, everybody can add it. And uh, I'm gonna copy the link. I'm gonna in the, uh, chat. All right. So, so what we're gonna do here is that um, I think all the RPI student, please be a group leader. Uh, uh, how many students we have here? I say it looks like we only have a, a handful. Oh, right? okay. Okay, that's fine. Um, that's that's even better. So maybe we don't need we we don't need this. So we'll you know. I think 10 we can handle. Yeah. Yeah, then we don't need this. Let's 
Okay, so now it's finished.